the following conversations with Jesse McDougall. Jesse and his wife, Callie, are among the, the leaders of regenerative agriculture in the northeastern part of the United States. And their messaging is definitely transcending far beyond their local region where they own and operate Studio Hill Farm. During the course of our conversation, we get into Jesse's path into regenerative ag and what really drove that as it came out of a family tragedy that he and his wife Kelly experienced. That really motivated them to take on ownership of, of being stewards of the land and the, the water and their entire biodynamic ecosystem that they're developing within agriculture. We also get into Jesse's work as an educator and leader to help mold and educate that next generation of regenerative producers. I'm Don Davidson. This is the Regenerative Agriculture Club podcast. And coming up is a wonderful conversation with Jesse McDougall. Enjoy. Hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Thrilled to be hanging out with Jesse McDougall. He and his wife, Callie, are the agricultural masterminds behind Studio Hill Farm in southern Vermont. Jesse, absolute pleasure to hang with you here today. Well, it's great. Great to be here. I appreciate it tremendously. So when I was going through the, the Studio Hill website, uh, you know, because normally I ask the guests, like, you know, specifically what areas of regenerative and sustainable ag you're all involved with. And I guess my takeaway from you all is like, what are you not all involved with? So, <laughs> fair, fair point. So I'm thrilled for what we're going to be able to cover here. But but before we get into the the specifics of the farm, I want to hear about your personal journey into this space and how this all became a real life uh, venture for you. My personal journey is um, all over the place. I, um, I you know I, I grew up in the mountains of New Hampshire, which was wonderful, um, but there weren't many farms near me. I didn't grow up. In ag, I didn't grow up, you know, I grew up in the woods, but not on tractors. And so I was very drawn to nature. I loved hiking. I loved getting out there on my dirt bike and, and probably wasn't the best <laughs> steward of the ecosystem at that point in my life. But I, I never thought about soil or nutrition or anything like that until I fell in love with Callie and, and set foot on her family's farm. She's fourth generation there. And and instantly fell in love with the place. And that must have been early 2000s that I was first there. She, of course, grew up going there every summer, every school vacation that she could. And, and it was her aunt who was running it at that time and had been for 40 years. And so it just clicked. You know, she loved it already. It clicked with me. And... um just fortunate to be able to go and have that place as a place to hang out. And it was a, a conventionally managed farm at that time. It started off as a, a dairy. Callie's great-grandparents bought it in 1936, mid at the tail end of the Depression, you know, t um, looking for food security for themselves and, and their community. And they wanted to send food back to New York City. And it was a small organic dairy because that's all there was. You know, there were no chemicals in ag at that point in this region. So in the 70s, it transitioned to a horse operation and horse boarding and hay and corn. And, and it took up all the chemicals that are usually associated with that kind of production. A lot of Roundup and Cali's on Edie uh, loved Roundup, said it smelled sweet in the air and would put on a backpack and go and spray all the hedgerows with it. And we kind of looked at her sideways. And then in 2011, uh, Edie got sick with brain cancer and um callie and i were living in vermont but but a few hours north and came down to live here half time at that point and and take care of what we could help with the cancer help Edie, help with the farming um and i was you know all thumbs at that point and i'm not much better now but i was you know all thumbs at that point and, and but just trying to be helpful and she passed a year later uh, Edie passed and and that's really where we kind of, we woke up one day as farmers and because Callie was next generation. And, you know, the first decision we made was to stop spraying all the chemicals on the land, stop tilling, planted everything back to grass. And, and you know, we were naively waiting for the, the flourish, the, the burst of life to come back to a land that was already bursting with, with plants and greenery. Um, but it went the other way. And, and, you know, we kicked the crutch out of a industrial production system and 
we witnessed the collapse of the farm production acres and it was it was more like a gravel pit than a hay farm and that's really where we started in regenerative ag and just losing Edie um was so devastating and and we kind of took it on as our personal mission to create as much life here as possible and and just learned as we went and and read and spoke with as many people as we could learn from and figured it out for our time and our place and our specific context. And, and it's been a, a severe education in um, managing complexity and learning. I, I sat down uh, when we learned we were farmers, you know, like there was a family discussion and who's going to take it up and all this kind of stuff. And when it came to us, I I went and I Googled what is grass because suddenly I was a grass farmer and I needed, <laughs> I needed to know and I didn't know where to start. So um, it's been a long, long road since then, but one that has been enormously rewarding. Well, I have so much admiration for what you and Callier have built and are building. Um, question on those those first critical years, what was your thought process of, you know, when, you, when you see this ecosystem that is not thriving the way that you and Callie want, what was your process and the ultimate decision to then kind of what, focus on the critical few? to to get get the the farm back to what you want. Well, we were panic, sheer panic. I think was our as far as our thought process went. When the, when the fields weren't growing in that spring of 2013 and again in 2014, we didn't know what we'd done wrong. We couldn't explain to you at that point why they weren't growing. Obviously, we came to figure it out, but we were we were driving around the county collecting every manure pile we could to put back onto the fields thinking very mechanically, they got to put something in to get something out. That was our thought process and it wasn't working. You know, we'd spread tons and tons of manure and it wasn't helping. We still saw, you know, washouts, ruts, bare soil, green slime, moss. Um, It was all desertifying. It was all just washing away despite our efforts and tremendous diesel fuel bills and tremendous time. And it wasn't until we stumbled upon holistic management and the idea of putting livestock back on pasture, which was, you know, completely antithetical to everything we understood at the time. You know, we had seen the wear that the dairy had done on the land when it was a dairy here. We had seen the destruction the horses had done on the land when it was a a horse boarding farm. And we were skeptical that putting animals back on the land would do anything, but we were desperate so we started with chickens and, and built these Joel Salatin style bottomless coops and, and moved the chickens every 12 hours. And we went with chickens because we were, weren't scared of chickens. We were scared of everything else and <laughs> the cows, sheep, goats, and, and all manner of responsibility, I guess, at that point. And so we um, started with chickens and, and, you know, once we got the chickens acting like chickens in the natural environment, at least interacting with the soil the way that birds do. There was a green strip of grass. We called it the green mohawk coming down the center of the field um, at the end of the summer. And we realized that we were the problem. You know, management was the problem. Animals aren't a problem in nature. Every healthy, thriving ecosystem on the planet is loaded with animals. And that's when it clicked for us that we're at a very odd point in the world where we believe that animals are bad for nature and poison is good for our food, you know? And, and we're like, oh, we were the problem. We're thinking about this wrong. Management has to change, not tools, not practices, but the management has to change. We're, we're part of this system and we need to dance within it, not enforce our will upon it. And that's when things really started spiraling up in the right direction for us. What were the most valuable sources of knowledge and, and research that, that you and Kelly went to when, when you really began the, the head down regenerative practice uh, implement? Oh, man. It's hard to pin down one. We were just hungry and, and didn't know anything ourselves and knew we didn't know anything ourselves. And so we, I didn't come from ag. She didn't go to ag school. So we knew we didn't know anything. And so we were, we talked to every farmer, no matter how he or she farmed, you know, organic, conventional, whatever. We talked to, we read every book we could. YouTube was huge. And eventually, you know, once we started to get some momentum, we got connected with the, the Savory Network and Holistic Managers there. And 
that became huge for us. And it just kind of all started spiraling up in this incredible wave of momentum and energy. It's like the more excited we became, the more excited folks around us became. And then the connections just started coming in. And it was it was a hell of a wild ride. I'm curious to hear about your your local market. Uh, I guess first question, is there a, a special meaning behind the name Studio Hill Farm? There is. That's a good question. So it was, you know, it's a, my kids are the fifth generation there. The farm had been passed down through daughters um, in each generation. And so the name of the farm changed every generation uh, with marriages, right? So it was uh, Stevenson Farm and then um, Pullman Farm and then, you know, back and forth and, and stuff as the and so people in the local area didn't know we were the same family, <laughs> which wasn't a problem. But in 1938, when the great grand, after the great grandparents bought the farm, literally, not, you know, you know <laughs> euphemistically, um, the there's they built a cabin on a spit of ledge that stuck out at a at a high point in the farm, and the cabin was a painting and poetry studio for them, and. The family had referred to that hill as Studio Hill for 80 plus years, and it was just used within the family. But when my wife and I decided to start there and build a business there, we wanted to get out of the familial naming convention and pick a name that would stick around. And so we went with Studio Hill because it meant a lot to us, and it was emblematic of the generations that had been there uh, working the land, you know, people that we never met, but love tremendously because we saw them every day and pictures on the wall and heard stories about them. And uh, yeah, but to your next question, the local market um, responded really well to what we were doing. And I, and I was surprised by it. Bennington is not an affluent town. There are 20 doctors, 20 professors in town that can afford local food regularly. Not everybody can. It's a, you know, a town that's very dependent on a Walmart and the drive through So when we thought, when we, we saw what we had to charge to cover our costs and not go immediately out of business, it was disheartening. We thought, oh man, nobody's going to buy chicken for $6 a pound or nobody can. But people did. They came out of the woodwork because they wanted to support what we were doing. And they didn't buy chicken every day, but they shot enough that we were, we were okay. And then when we got into lamb, I thought, well, we got into lamb, um, for the land, you know, and I, uh, we didn't get into lamb because we thought lamb was a good market in, in this country. We just happened into it uh, because it was right for our wet rolling hills. And, and I was then again surprised by the local market's demand for lamb. And it helped us in the early years tremendously to have a, a really good local market, but then in dedicated customers who I'm tremendously grateful for, but then we hit the ceiling of the local market very, very soon. And we couldn't expand our flock to the level we wanted, which would allow us to regenerate as much land as we wanted, because we couldn't sell it and we couldn't process it. We couldn't, you know, th there were very low ceilings in terms of market and infrastructure available to us. So we had to find alternate ways forward. And what were those alternate ways that, that uh, turned out to be? That's where we get into how we ended up with our hands in every part of this. Um, okay, let's hear it. I love it. <laughs> I just want to say for you and listeners, if I could be an anonymous, lonely shepherd on a hill with my flock, that's what I would be. And, and it turns out that the food system is so broken right now that in order to do that profitably, we have to redesign the whole food system. You know, rural areas are getting crushed under the weight of the industrial food system. And we're losing a thousand farms a year in the Northeastern US. Food margins are so slim and we're competing with McDonald's and Walmarts in our towns. And it's just hard to own land and operate land profitably selling just food, right? But that's what I want to do. You know, I just want to tend to my flock and sell healthy food and then go back to tending my flock. But one day I'm, I'm talking to a group of, you know, inventively minded citizens. You know, it's a 350.org node called Earth Matters here locally, and I love them. A great 
great group of people. And they were asking me about regenerative ag and, and what we'd been able to do on Studio Hill. And I was just, you know, in a mood that day and complaining about how we can't grow beyond a certain point because there's nothing in the area. There's no infrastructure. And well, the question is always comes to, this is great. Love what you're doing. Why doesn't every farm do this? Because you're, you're making more money and you're regenerating the ecosystem and all the natural resources. And why isn't everybody doing this? And the answer is because you, the local market can't absorb 50 of these farms. And if if I wanted to regenerate as many acres as I could, I need a thousand sheep and I can't find processing for a thousand sheep, whether it's wool or whether it's meat, you know, or milk. I was just kind of spouting off about how farmer complainer, farmer complaining, which is, you know, a usual, it's a common trope. But at the end of the meeting, a gentleman walks up to me and who had been listening intently but quiet the whole meeting and and said you know there's money to do this and i said okay great and he said no seriously there's money to do this we can we can build this infrastructure and i said great you you go do that i'm gonna go farm and he like looked at the ceiling he said okay i will and i didn't hear from him for like six months eight months and then he sent me an email he said i've spoken with everybody in vermont that i could get a meeting with about the food system and and farming and regenerative ag and turns out you know a little bit about what you're talking about and we're going to do it we're going to form a company that rebuilds the food system in this area a de- decentralized resilient you know nodal food network where we can have an actual an actually resilient regenerative food system that creates exports again from rural regions to the cities and then delivers them there on in electric vehicles powered by renewable energy produced on the farms that are producing the food. Like that is the whole system. That is like what allows humans to not eat ourselves off the planet, you know, if we're able to do that. And really big pie in the sky stuff. And and I said, that sounds great. He said, do you want to partner with us as the ag, you know, portion of this partnership? And I, I threw my hat in the ring. I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's figure it out. And so they found funding and we got going. We started a company called Regenerative Food Network and just spent two years doing research and design and trying to figure out what this area needed, who was doing great work, who needed financing, who needed to get you know, bigger, who needed to expand and who needed it. Where were the gaps in the system? So uh, we just started like building out meat plants and distribution hubs and we purchased a all natural organic tannery and that we reopened and trying to make use of whole animals and and zero waste system and a circular economy and electric vehicle fleets and we just started doing it and now that's my job I'm we're now building that out and we were able to you know hire more people to help on the home farm and it's been fun and we've been making real good progress with that so we're hoping that that we can build that out to support all types of family farms through the region. We started with meat production and a company we created called Southshire Meats as a local aggregator because there's demand. We found demand for meat. And in our eco region, getting animals on the ground managed holistically is the quickest way to regenerate the ecosystem. And then once we have a meat operation going, that creates a demand for regenerative grains to feed the omnivores we're raising the pigs and the chickens and turkeys and whatnot Uh, so the meat was really like the point in the spear trying to pierce through the industrial food system and bring bring in a lot of farmers in behind it so we can get into produce and then dairy and really try to build a new system kind of under the radar and do it in a way that it wasn't owned by one company or one family or one whatever do it but in a way that's owned by the employees and owned by the towns and owned by the or the people in the town and the regions that have an interest in it so we're partnering and we're creating companies and employee owned um, everything eventually and then just we're playing connector we're saying well you you know let's build this actual flowing system and making sure everything kind of flows in the right direction and, and and we're verifying all the everything that we can we're collecting all the data we can from topsoil growth to carbon emitted to food deserts filled in and you know we're not perfect but we're trying in every everywhere we can 
to get it right. Well, it almost seems like it, the the story is kind of coming full circle for where in those early days when you were just grasping for any and all lessons and knowledge out there, where now almost you wear that educator hat. I know you're doing that through the, the Savory Institute Influencer Hub. So curious about like, you know, kind of as you're doing coaching and mentoring out there, I mean, what's the messaging to the, the next generation of young regenerative ag professionals? I think the message is that it's possible. I think my role as educator is to show people that it's possible, that we can regenerate the Earth's natural resources while feeding ourselves, and that a, a, an abundant, peaceful future is possible. I like to think about it like this. You know, do you remember in Driver's Ed when they teach you about target fixation? Right? There's this phenomenon where drivers... Um, are going down the road and like a truck swerves into the lane and you see this phenomenon where they drivers will swerve into the oncoming truck. And they call that target fixation where when a human is panicking, every thought goes out of their head. And when you're panicking, you do the one thing you can think of. You know, and this, if there's only one thing in your head, which is I'm going to hit this truck, you swerve into it. It's the one thing you can think to do. And so I think that's happening now on a global scale with climate change. And there's so much bad news out there. And the media loves showing it to us. No, I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm just saying that they don't fill in the, with good stories behind it. You know, like the sky is falling is, you know, drives a lot of clicks, drives a lot of eyeballs. And so we hear a lot about it. And humans are panicking. We're suffering from target fixation about the end of the world. And we're swerving right into it. But, you know, if your memory driver said, they would teach you when you're getting on the on-ramp for the highway, have a plan B in your head. Like say to yourself, if the truck comes in my lane, I'm going to swerve. If the truck comes in my lane, I'm going to swerve. Truck, swerve. And so when the truck comes in your lane, your first thought is swerve because you've practiced it, because you see another way. And I think it's important for us to show people regenerative ag and what's possible as another way forward so that when people are confronted with the end of the world and climate change, they don't think we're doomed. They think it's time to build a bed the other way to do it. And I think that's what Studio Hill is set up to do is to now a kind of, a, you know, we're a savory influencer hub and our role in that is to invite people in and show them what's possible with holistic management and with livestock and with, in our, in our region, there are a lot of ways to do ecosystem regeneration through ag, whether it's perennial crops or what have you. It's practice, you know, independent. But our role is to invite people in and show them what's possible. And, and we found that with our Farm Stays program, it's one of our best inspirational um, enterprises. People come in, stay in our cabin, stay in our hilltop house and see clouds of butterflies and see foxes and bunnies and, and deer and the occasional moose and thousands of birds of every species. And it looks like a Disney movie. And people don't think of that as what farming is now. And they go home to Brooklyn and they go home to Portland or Lisbon or wherever they're from. And they say to their friends, you have to go see this place. It's unbelievable. This is what they're doing, and, and it's possible. And I call it hope tourism, you know? And if we can prove to the masses that this is possible, it, it changes how people make decisions, you know? And it changes how people purchase their food, and it changes the energy people have going into life in their own enterprises to believe that, oh, we can, we can get this right, you know? We're living in a very anti-human society right now, and it irks me because I think humans are fabulous and can be better. Um, and I have kids, and I want to see them grow and thrive and, and have kids of their own. And yeah, we've been, we've been messing it up, sure. Doesn't mean we can't get it right. And I, I believe that you know, humans have gotten it right in the past um, for you know, millennia, and humans have gotten it wrong in the past for millennia. And we have to take the lessons from people, indigenous and, and current, who are getting it right and have the humility <laughs> to understand we don't know much of anything. Nature knows what she's doing, and we're usually in the way if we're interacting at all. But take cues from processes and people smarter than yourself and be happy to be wrong. I'm happy to be wrong, you know, all the time. When I'm wrong, I'm thrilled about it because that's that's that I can learn, I can grow, I can, I can improve. 
when I'm right, I, you know, there's no growth in that. And I'm very rarely right, which is a relief. So that's what I think we need to teach the next generation is, you know, don't be afraid of being wrong, but we have to move in. The, and don't be, don't be so distraught by the news that you don't believe you can get it right. That's a wonderful thought. Jesse, what's coming next, with, whether it's Studio Hill Farm, uh, all the other ventures that, that you're um, uh, building and, and creating, where, where is your time allocated right now that's, that, that we will all see from the outside over the next one to three years to develop? Oh, man. Uh, well, that's a great question. I mean, I would love a nap. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> This is all very exciting, but it's been a whirlwind and I'm pretty squeezed. But it's all very exciting. I mean, the Regenerative Food Network is growing. We have a bunch of distributed infrastructure running. We're now building out a the first of what we're calling a regenerative food center in Bennington, Vermont. And that's going to be the hub in our hub and spoke model of a regional food system that is designed to reverse the Walmart effect and get money back into the hands of farmers and and working families and create jobs in the area, good jobs on the land. And we're creating companies within the Regenerative Food Network to to do that, like Southshire Meats and Vermont Natural Sheepskins. And so that's going to be my push for the next five, seven years, I think, is to try to prove this out, try to prove out that we, in this region, in this time, we can build a system that regenerates our natural resources and feeds us. Uh, makes families whole and reverses rural economic and ecological degradation at the hands of industries that just externalize their costs on upon the rest of us. And then from there, if we prove it out here, we want to, you know, help other regions do it for themselves. You know, just take the lessons we've learned here and offer it to other regions. And we understand that what we build here may not work in Bhutan and Exactly. Or we know that it won't, you know, context matters, but we can, or the Pacific Northwest or, you know, wherever, but we want to make ourselves available to help other regions do the same thing. And on the home front, Studio Hill is expanding. We're thrilled to be growing. Um, We are buying land and expanding our livestock and, and regenerative enterprises and purchasing new farm stays buildings to invite more people in and We've been able to do so only because we were a regenerative farm and and had a track record of regenerating natural resources and money was, you know, capital was available to us because of that. Um, If we had been a conventional farm, we wouldn't have been able to expand. We'd probably be continuing on the downward spiral of economic and ecological degradation and in real trouble right now. But because we were in a moment in time where this has a lot of attention, a lot of focus, it also has a lot of financial backing. And it's really invigorating, I think, to see that happening. You know, when we started with this in 2012, started experimenting with it, you know, we weren't the first by any stretch of the imagination and, and we didn't invent anything. But but it was at a point where there wasn't really, at least I couldn't find a term for it. It was like restoration agriculture or regenerative agriculture or whatever. And and when I would say what we're doing, people were like, that's, that's not a thing. And, um, and now, of course, it's being, you know, said on the presidential stage. So it's just been a, a whirlwind in the right direction. And I think it's because it gives people so much hope and that it's an actual, it represents an actual solution to so many of the problems we're seeing today. Because it's the root cause of so many of the problems we're seeing today. How we treat our environments and how we treat nature is creating, you know, climate change and climate refugees and, and deserts and scarcity and and human health issues and and species extinction and you know the list goes on and on and so people see hope in the fact that we can reverse all those things and, and address root causes instead of just you know the things that we're told to do to save the world like use less plastic or fly less or drive less or you know eat less meat those are not solutions you know they're all good things to do you know but they're not solutions. They're stalling tactics, right? Even if we do those things, we're still at a point where there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere and we're experiencing runaway climate change. The only solution is to get the CO2 back in underground, you know, 
there are only three places the Earth can hold carbon, and that's the oceans is CO2, which is the acidification of the oceans. The atmosphere is carbon dioxide, which is contributing to climate change and global warming. And the soil has organic matter, and two of those places are maxed out, and one of them is in dire need of it. So I think this idea of repairing the carbon cycle, using agriculture in places around the planet, in the farmland, but also in the grasslands and in the deserts, we can get the carbon back underground again. And we can, on the, on the heels of the carbon, the water, the excess water in the atmosphere will go into the ground and be stored in the ground because the soil will have the carbon in it. It'll be spongy and will hold the water. And the water is heating the planet. The water vapor is heating the planet faster than the carbon and methane and all those others. But we can cool the planet. Uh, in 15, 20 years, we can start seeing the global ice caps reforming. We can see the polar bears start to have more range and more food, you know, and we can see the pumps turn off in Miami, in the Miami streets. We can, we can do that. We'll still have problems to wrestle with, but we can turn this around if we, as a species, band together and understand it's possible. It's been an absolute pleasure hanging with you here on, on the podcast, and my hat goes off to you for your vision and leadership with what you're building and have already created thus far. Where do you want folks to go online just to stay in touch with your work and how they can support everything that you're involved with? Well, great. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. I would invite folks to check out our farm website. That's studiohill.farm. Also, if you're interested in the bigger regional play where the Regenerative Food Network is at regenfood.net, R-E-G-E-N-F-O-O-D.net. And from there, you can navigate down into all the different projects we're taking on in the region. As always, come see us at Studio Hill. We have beds for you. <laughs> We'd love to invite you, Don, and, and all your listeners to come see us and see what we're doing. Love it. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you.